So, Lehman Kessler made a joke about uh, ASMR James. For those who don't know what ASMR is, it's one of those weird sort of YouTube meets fetish meets strange fringe psychoanalysis kind of stuff. Uh, YouTube things. Um, it's, uh, it's generally like videos of women whispering. Yeah, humans. Y'all are weird. You, you got weird things you do. It's beautiful and it's weird. And no problem there. But uh, yeah, ASMR. Um, so I kind of barely know what it is, but there are triggers. And the triggers of ASMR here, here are the stimuli that can trigger it according to Wikipedia, because Wikipedia knows everything. Uh, stimuli that can trigger ASMR. Uh, which, that, again, that's that tingling sensation that whispered things give you. Um, listening to a softly spoken or whispering voice. Listening to quiet, repetitive sounds resulting from someone engaging in a mundane task, such as turning the pages of a book. Watching someone attentively execute a mundane task, such as preparing food. Well, I'm not in the kitchen, so I'm not doing that here. Receiving altruistic personal attention. So, I'm really glad you tuned in. Thank you for tuning in. See, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to work the magic here. And initiating the stimulus through conscious manipulation without the need for external video or audio triggers. And I have no idea what that last one means. But, um, what I do know is, I'm going to read you a real short piece out of the best of M.R. James. Uh, the best ghost stories of M.R. James. This is a uh, tower mystery book. I, I do love this cover. Yeah, I know the, uh, the Mylar is messing with you here. Also has a really cool ad for more stuff in their line on the back cover. Man, maybe I should do that. Anywho, um, so I'm going to whisper you a story, and this is called Stories I Have Tried to Write. I'm going to get real close and in your ear here. Stories I have tried to write. I have neither much experience nor much perseverance in the writing of stories. I'm thinking exclusively of ghost stories, for I never cared to try any other kind. And it has amused me sometimes to think of the stories which have crossed my mind from time to time and never materialized properly. Never properly. For some of them I have actually written down and they repose in a drawer somewhere to borrow Sir Walter Scott's most frequent quotation, look upon them, again I dare not. They were not good enough, yet some of them had ideas in them which refused to blossom in the surroundings I had devised for them, but perhaps came up in other forms and stories that did get as far as print. Let me recall them for the benefit, so to style it, of someone else. There was the story of a man traveling in a train in France. Facing him sat a typical French woman of mature years with the usual mustache and a very confirmed countenance. He had nothing to read but an antiquated novel he had bought for its binding. Madame du Lichtenstein, it was called. Tired of looking out of the window and studying his vis-a-vis, -vis, he began drowsily turning the pages and paused at a conversation between two of the characters. They were discussing an acquaintance, a woman who lived in a largish house at Marseille le Haire. The house was described, and uh, here we were coming to a point. The mysterious disappearance of the woman's husband, her name was mentioned, and my reader couldn't help thinking he knew it in some other connection. Just then, the train stopped at a country station. The traveler, with a start, woke up from his daze. The book open in his hand. The woman opposite him got out, and on the label of her bag, he read the name that he seemed to be in his novel. Well, he went on to Troy's. And from there he made excursions, and one of these took him at lunchtime to, yes, Marseille de Hare. The hotel 
In the grand place faced a three-gabbled house of some pretensions. Out of it came a well-dressed woman whom he had seen before. Conversation with the waiter. Yes, the lady was a widow, so it was believed. At any rate, nobody knew what had become of her husband here. I think we broke down, of course. There was no such conversation in the novel as the Trowther thought he had read. Then, there was quite a long one about two undergraduates spending Christmas in a country house that belonged to one of them. An uncle, next heir to the estate, lived near, plausible and learned Roman priest living with the uncle, makes himself agreeable to the young men. Dark walks home at night after dining with the uncle, curious disturbances as they pass through the shrubberies, strange shapeless tasks in the snow around the house observed in the morning. Efforts to lure away the companion and isolate the proprietor and get him to come out after dark. Ultimate defeat and death of the priest, upon whom the familiar, balked of another victim, turns. Also, the story of two students of King's College, Cambridge, in the 16th century, who were, in fact, expelled thence for magical practices, and their nocturnal expedition to a witch at Fitton Stanton, and of how, at the turning to Lulworth, on the hunting down road, they met a company leading an unwilling figure whom they seemed to know, and of how. On arriving at Finn Stanton, they learned of the witch's death and of what they saw seated upon her newly dug grave. There were some of the tales which got as far as the stage of being written down, at least in part. There were others that flitted across the mind from time to time, but never really took shape. The man, for instance, naturally a man with something on his mind who Sitting in his study one evening was startled by a slight sound, turned hastily and saw a certain dead face looking out from between the window curtains, a dead face, but with living eyes. He made a dash at the curtains and tore them apart. A pasteboard mask fell to the floor, but there was no one there, and the eyes of the mask were but eye holes. What was to be done about that? There is the touch on the shoulder that comes when you are walking quickly onward in the dark hours full of anticipation of the warm room and bright fire. And when you pull up, startled, what face or no face do you see? Similarly, when Mr. Badman had decided to settle the hash of Mr. Goodman, and had picked out just the right thicket by the roadside from which to fire at him. How came it exactly that when Mr. Goodman and his unexpected friend actually did pass, they found something of what he had found waiting for them, even beckoning to him in the thicket, enough to prevent them from looking into it themselves. There are possibilities here. But the labor of constructing the proper setting has been beyond me. There may be possibilities too in the Christmas cracker. If the right people pull it and if the motto which they find inside has the right message on it, they will probably leave the party early, pleading indisposition, but very likely a previous engagement of long standing would be the more truthful excuse. In parenthesis, many common objects may be made the vehicles of retribution. And where retribution is not called for of malice. Be careful how you handle the packet you pick up in the carriage drive, particularly if it contains snail parings and hair. Do not in any case bring it into the house. It may not be alone. Dots are believed by many writers of our day to be a good substitute for effective writing. They are certainly an easy one. Let us have a few more. 
Late on Monday night, a toad came into my study, and though nothing has seemed so far to link itself with this appearance, I feel that it may not be quite prudent to brood over topics which may open the interior eye to the presence of more formidable visitants. Enough said. So that was M.R. James. It was out of the best ghost stories of M.R. James. And uh, that was stories I have tried to write. Kind of a fun little essay. And I hope you enjoyed me whispering to you. Um, I'm not sure if I'm going to do another chapter of 1984 today. But if I do, uh, it'll be at noon on the Word Horde Facebook page. And I'll read to you more soon.